Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you. Uh, some of you joining here in person, some of you joining by way of the video, and uh, we're appreciative of everyone that's here. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is with us today. So this is Sunday, the 17th of May, 2020. And uh, I'm glad that we're in the Lord's house. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And certainly I hope that you have joy uh, in worshiping together with us by one way or another. I've titled my message this morning, The Coming of the Lord. I believe that we're drawing closer and closer to his soon return. And that ought to be encouraging to us, regardless of where we're at in our spiritual walk and where we're at in our physical life whether it's the early years or the later years of life or somewhere in between, uh, we just know that it's most important to walk with the King Jesus and to make sure that he's Lord and master of our life and that our sins are forgiven. I'm going to share a couple passages with you as I begin this morning. Uh, the first one is in John 14, the first three verses, and then we'll read some scripture out of Matthew chapter 24. In John 14, Starting with the first verse, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Some of you probably have troubled hearts during this time of difficulty. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there ye may be also. Let's bow in prayer as we begin this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for those comforting words given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Words not just to the disciples in the upper room shortly before his arrest and trials and, and uh, the crucifixion, but Lord, I believe these words continue down through the thousands of years of time, that Lord Jesus, you're speaking to our hearts and minds, telling us that we be not troubled or soon shaken, but rather, dear Lord, that we would learn to rest in you and you alone. We thank you also for the promise in this passage that you're preparing a place for us. You're preparing uh, mansions in glory for us to continue to be with you forever and ever. And Lord, I, I delight in that thought and I'm encouraged in that thought. And I pray, Lord, even in this time of, of peril throughout this nation and this entire world, that we would take heart the promises that you have given to us, knowing that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Bless our service this morning for those in person and for those watching by way of video. The Lord, you would speak to hearts and lives. Glorify yourself. I pray that uh, those who are saints, those who are saved and born again, would be drawn closer to you. That those who are sinners, those who are lost, those who need the Lord Jesus might come under conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, we might all seek your shining face, knowing that you're coming soon. And I love you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that that this message would go forth in power and in word, dear Lord, to the saving of the lost and the confirming of salvation to those who are saved for the glory of God. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you turn to Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to start with the fourth verse. Uh, this is a part of the passage called the Olive Olivet Discourse, where Jesus sits down with the disciples and teaches them for the 24th and 25th chapters of Matthew, about things that are to come. The disciples wondered what was going to happen. And they had asked at the beginning of this chapter, uh, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? You know, when are these things going to happen? And Jesus is here in the middle now of explaining this to them as we take it up in the fourth verse. I'll read verses 4 through 8, and then we'll jump down to look at verses 29 through 33. In the fourth verse, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Why? Because there are people that want to deceive us, even today. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And now over, starting in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, 
and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth of heaven excuse me, to the other. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Folks, we cannot know the exact time of Christ's return. Jesus said himself in the 36th verse, if you still have chapter 24 open there, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of, my, of heaven, but my Father only. But yet he gave a number of signs, a number of indicators that we should be aware of as we approach the return of the Lord. We're rapidly moving toward the climax of earth's history and the return of Jesus Christ is near. In fact, every sign seems to indicate that the coming of Christ is at hand, which is exactly what he said uh, there in, in uh, that 33rd verse. It is near, even at the door. He covered some of the signs that we could be aware of in the coming days just prior to his soon return. He talked in verse number 7 about signs in nature. In that 7th verse, he, he talked about uh, there are going to be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Uh, these signs in nature seem to be around us. We've heard of famines. Uh, there was locust plagues over there in the Middle East, in Africa, destroying a lot of crops and people don't have food to eat. Well, we've heard of earthquakes at different places around the earth, some of them very serious. And certainly we're in the middle of pestilence and plagues uh, with this coronavirus, along with other things that we've faced with in the past. It's sort of interesting that uh, as we think about this pestilence or, or these plagues, uh, which now they call a, a pandemic, um, an epidemic would be more localized in a, a smaller area. A pandemic indicates that it's something affecting the entire world. And, uh, you know, in, in most states, uh, we still have a lot of businesses that are closed down. And, and not to get too political, but it's sort of interesting in the states that seem to be primarily closed at this point, they're run by Democratic governors. And people are wanting to get out, to get back to work, to get back to life as normal. And I know it's important to take some precautions. And I think our state of Mississippi has done a pretty good job as we've eased on back into things. And I appreciate what our governor has done. But it, uh, it seems like there are many of the Democrats that just don't want people to be able to get their jobs, to, to keep their businesses, to be able to pay their bills. They'd rather just hand out money from the government that sooner or later people are going to have to pay for. We just can't indefinitely print money and hand it out and continue with a strong nation the way we have been. The reason I'm mentioning about this pandemic and a problem with the Democrats, if you think of that word pandemic, you can see right in the middle of that word pandemic, Dems, and the word panic. It seems like that's what's happening. We have many people who are panicking, including the news media and other things that are going on. In fact, some people have considered this coronavirus to be a plandemic, that something that may have been planned or at least the people moving us toward a one world government are taking advantage of this to move us very strongly in that direction. This COVID-19, I would believe, is certainly part of Satan's plan of the ages. Uh, he may just have come upon this lately uh, to use this to fight against us, but I think Satan is the one who's ultimately behind all of this, and he has his people in places of power and position in the world economy and in the world government who are part of this one world movement. And one of the worst offenders is an American by the name of Bill Gates. You might uh, know of him from fame of uh, starting Microsoft Corporation, one of the richest men in the entire world. Uh, and, and he uh, is, is involved with uh, planning vaccines. Uh, it, it's amazing if you look into his life and it, it seems like he's sort of a self-proclaimed Messiah. He's got a Messiah complex, believing that he has the answer to the human racist problems. 
he and uh, his wife Melinda and their foundation have gone throughout parts of the world to give out vaccines that in many cases have killed people or harmed people rather than help people and help save lives. He's a eugenicist. He believes in eugenics. That's the idea that there are too many people on the planet. We need to get rid of people who are not strong in body or strong in mind, that uh, we need to cut down Earth's population massively. And I do not trust this man, uh, the, this man who thinks that he's going to be the savior of the world. It's interesting that last year in June, uh, Bill Gates and uh, his, uh, one of his corporations with Microsoft had filed for a patent uh, that they, they call it ID 2020, uh, or the, the COVID 060606. That is the patent number, 060606. You take out the three O's and you've got 666. It sounds like we're getting mighty close to that mark of the beast. Uh, so that uh, patent was uh, granted in June of 2019 uh, in the United States, and then there's a world patent that was registered back in April 22 of 2020. And uh, basically, <clears throat> this idea of, of this uh, vaccine is to give us all some sort of a digital identification code that's embedded in our skin and in our system. A code to track us, a code to tag. In fact, I almost think of this like a tag that you might put on an animal, you know, a dog tag or, or a, a, nowadays they're microchipping a lot of, of their pets and their animals. It's like they're wanting to give us all some sort of an identification number. And I think they're going to try to push that on the world through this new vaccine that's supposed to save us from this virus. By the way, you know that there is no flu vaccine, don't you? You can get a flu shot, but it's not a vaccination. It doesn't keep you from getting the flu. There are usually they pick up the three likely strains for the upcoming year and manufacture what they call a vaccine, but is really just a flu shot. And it's a hit or miss proposition. Oftentimes they miss it by more than 50%. In other words, a vaccine should be one that would prevent someone from getting a disease. The flu vaccine doesn't do it. It's a flu shot. Now, if we think back uh, from years ago, uh, Jonas Salk come out, uh, uh, you know, with the polio vaccine, you know, praise the Lord, that worked. That pretty well stopped polio uh, in our country. That's what a vaccine is designed to do. Uh, but this thing they're calling a vaccine may not be so much to keep someone from getting a disease. It looks like it's going to be a tag to identify people who have, have already been tested for it. And it's going to carry some digital code to identify you and give your basically your vaccination type of history. I just, I don't often preach quite in this manner, but I feel like this is in a dangerous time and, and it looks like all this is coming to play so swiftly upon us because of this virus that has been unleashed upon the world. Whether that virus has come by way of accident or on purpose, I don't know. I'm not sure that we'll ever know, but we, we've got to understand that what all these one worlders are planning for us is not good for us. It's not good for us. And I'm very skeptical of, of some of the things that they are planning. So this Bill Gates with his messianic complex, his, his idea that he's going to solve the world's problems if we just do what he recommends, even though it may not be for our good, it's for the good of the one worlders. We see that there's a building of a one world government system and one world religion is coming on the scene. So I shared with you, first of all, the signs in nature from verse number seven. And then also, uh, as part of that, we have negative spiritual signs. Jesus said that there would come false Christs, false messiahs, false prophets, people who would come claiming to be the solution to the human problem when the human problem is not a coronavirus. That's not our worst problem. The worst problem of the human race is sin. Amen? It's sin. And the only remedy for sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches us. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. We need the blood of Christ applied so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. But the devil raises up people who are false prophets, false Christs, false messiahs. There's apostasy that's going to happen in these end times. And I think we're already seeing a lot of that. It's sad in my heart that so many 
of our churches and preachers have turned away from the King James Bible. I listen to some of these sermons of people using other versions of the Bible, and as they're reading along and preaching, I notice that words and even ideas and concepts are changed, and it doesn't really teach what the King James Bible teaches. And I'm leery of these modern versions. We have a lot of our Bible seminaries training uh, the Bible preachers who have gone somewhat liberal, or at least sort of what they call moderate, and uh, help these students to question their faith and their belief in the Bible itself. And that's dangerous. We see a move toward a one world religion and a one world government. There have been these agencies or these groups that, that sort of we hear about from time to time, uh, the Bilderbergs and the Rothschilds and, and uh, uh, David Rockefeller was big in on this and, and many of the other leaders in the world, George Soros and, and others, who seem to be very influential in the world to drive us to the breakdown of the United States of America to pull us into a one world government and one world religion. I first heard it talked about publicly by a president during George Bush, George W. Bush, the 41st president of the United States in the late 1990s, when he himself started talking about the new world order. That's what he wanted to build, and many people are still working on that, including this Bill Gates and George Soros. And I just feel like it's time to start naming some names and to warn people, sort of like in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told by the Lord, I've sent you as a watchman on the wall. If you don't warn the people, then I'm going to require their blood at your hand. You know, I've got to warn about what's coming because... Most of all, the important thing for Christians is that the coming of the Lord is drawing nigh, but we need to see what's going on in our nation and in the world to bring us to that point. So there's a one world religion that's going to be uh, pushed upon everybody. And that religion, it seems like today is focused more on climate change and, uh, and, and bringing people together to believe in that and, and to draw people together so that by the time the mark of the beast is here, People are literally worshiping that Antichrist and worshiping the devil. That's what taking of that mark would indicate. The Bible also speaks of coming persecution of believers. And we see that happening. I mean, why is it in many of these states that churches are told they cannot meet, but yet the liquor stores are open, the abortion clinics are open, uh, all these other places of business are, are up and running, and those that have a small business... Um, if somebody who uh, like takes care of cutting hair or, or a hairstylist can't have their business open under threat of arrest and imprisonment and fines uh, because America doesn't trust them, or at least these liberals don't trust them. I think most of us are, are wise enough to know how to keep somewhat distance away, to wash our hands frequently, to follow the guidelines, wear a mask if you're in a big crowd. Uh, th that's good to do. And I think we're smart enough to understand what to do. But there are things going on to try to take away our freedom, our liberty, to try to control us, to move us toward a one world government. So we have a loss of our rights and our freedoms. If we look at the Constitution of the United States, which praise the Lord is a wonderful, blessed document. God led our founding fathers in the preparation of the, the uh, Declaration of Independence and then of the Constitution. And the very first amendment to the Constitution was guaranteeing us five specific rights that it seems like the governors throughout this country have tried to take away from us. The very first one addressed is our right to freedom of religion. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And yet these governors and mayors and, and county commissioners seem like they, they're little mini tyrants who are trying to control people. Imagine arresting pastors who are uh, preaching to, to their congregation, who are sitting in their automobiles listening over a radio receiver, who are distancing, who are safe, and, and yet they're wanting to sh shut down these churches. Well, we did close for about three Sundays, and we're back open, and I'm thankful for those that come. We're still just having a small group here, and that's fine. And uh, we have this uh, video that's now able to reach out to many people. But there are many churches where pastors are still under threat of arrest uh, or, or chaining the churches to padlock them because they don't want them to meet. Why are they coming after the churches? In that First Amendment, we also have the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, 
the, the freedom to peaceably assemble. That means to get together. And that's why in many states there are big protest groups trying to, to let the governors know we want to open the state back up because people are dying and starving because of the closing of the government. You know, it, it's not just the virus that is causing death, but um, this, this whole crisis and this closing of the country has resulted in suicides and some people not getting surgeries that they need at the time that they need it, and it's causing a lot of problems. And then the other right that's guaranteed in that First Amendment is to, uh, to petition the government for redress of grievances. Those are five specific things mentioned in our, our First Amendment. And uh, the other amendments are important too. The Fourth Amendment, we should be secure in our papers and in our persons. But yet they're, they're wanting to stop people and, and try to ID them and identify them with this tag that they're wanting to put on folks with an upcoming vaccine. It's a loss of our rights and our freedoms. They're beginning to track people. They're developing apps for smartphones to track people who've had the virus or, or uh, to let people know if, if a person has had the virus so that they can warn them if you get close to each other. In some areas, they're, they're actually going into people's homes and specifically asking questions and wanting to know if there's anyone sick. And I've heard in some of the areas, not entire states, but in some counties in states, where they want to come in and force everybody in the household to be tested. And if there's small children in the household and anyone's tested for the COVID virus positive, they'll take the children out of the household. You know, it, it's, it's just not right. This is America. We're supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we have so many of these evil things working against us. And then there's an outbreak of demonic and occult activity. Uh, I, I don't know the extent of it, and I don't think any of you do either, because, folks, we don't move around within that realm of evil and demonic activity. But I believe it's becoming more and more active as the days go by. We're living in very uh, dangerous and wicked times. So there are signs of nature, there are some negative spiritual signs, and then there are also some positive spiritual signs as well. Uh, there still is evangelism going on. Uh, I stopped by Walmart yesterday afternoon and uh, happened to notice uh, that there was a, I uh, know, I'm sorry, it was the day before yesterday, uh, that there was a lady and a, a man sitting near the back of their vehicle, and the vehicle was open in the back, and they had up a sign that said, Free Bibles. And they were wanting to give people the Word of God. I thought, praise the Lord. Here's someone that's wanting to do something to reach out to folks to give them God's message. Uh, perhaps there will be a great revival or a great awakening in these last days before the coming of the Lord. That would be wonderful if that would happen, and I, I pray that it does. And then there are some accelerator signs. Here's a passage in Daniel chapter 12, verse number 4. I want to share that verse with you. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel revealed a lot of things in, in the prophecies of Daniel, but that's thousands of years ago. We're now understanding a lot of what Daniel wrote and what God gave him. But it says, uh, and even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. People of Daniel's day, the people of Jesus' day, even hundreds of years ago, would not have believed that the, how fast and quickly people are moving today. It's only been within about the last 130, 40 or so years that the automobile has, has become uh, a common thing to, to begin to see in public. And people riding in airplanes, like you, Orville and Wilbur Wright, you know, uh, inventing the airplane. And now people can uh, hop and go from one continent to another continent in a matter of hours, uh, flying in these airplanes all over the place. I know there's not so many planes going right now, not too many people are flying, and I don't blame them. I don't think I'd like to be in a little enclosed cabin up there in the air when people are sick and coughing and sneezing and you don't know what you're going to catch. But Daniel 12.4 says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The rate of knowledge increased is just amazing. It's astounding. It's impossible for any one person to keep up with all the knowledge and information. So there's an increase in knowledge, an increase in travel, and unfortunately, there's also an increase in violence. That's another accelerator sign. If you still have Matthew 24 open, you can look in that 12th verse where he said, and because iniquity, and iniquity is just another name for sin, 
Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There's going to be an increase in iniquity, an increase in sin. And then let me go on to number five. Uh, some other signs that Jesus mentions are the, is the signs of Israel, regathering of the people. And so uh, when we turned over there to verse number 29 of chapter 24, uh, and it talked about some of these signs that would come after the tribulation, and I believe we're going to be gone before the tribulation. I, I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the believers of the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, but it, it, uh, it tells us in that 31st verse, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And so uh, there, there is the gathering of the people. And I didn't uh, read all of this next part, but he talked about the parable of the fig tree. I'm not going to read it again. Uh, and most Bible scholars believe this fig tree is a picture of Israel. And Israel began to be gathered back into the land back in uh, May 14th of uh, 1948. It was recognized as a nation uh, as the people of Israel began to gather together. And there, you know, there's a difference between it, uh, the Jews and us. The Jews are waiting for the first coming of the Messiah. We're waiting for a second coming. The real Messiah has already come, but most Jewish people don't understand that. They don't recognize that. They think he's going to come for the first time, but they're going to be shocked and surprised to find out that he's already been here and he's coming back again soon. But Israel is regathering. I'll share with you a verse in Isaiah 11, 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. God gathering together the dispersed of, of Israel. And then in Ezekiel 37 and verse number 14, God said, and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. God says, not only am I going to gather you together, but I'm going to put you in the land. That's a promise that God gave to Israel. Going back to Matthew 24 once again, that 36th verse that I mentioned earlier in this message. Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We can't know the day and the time of Christ's return. There have been preachers and cult leaders and others who have set dates, and those dates have come and gone. If you hear of somebody setting a specific date for the return of Christ, just figure out they don't know what they're talking about. Either they're, they're deceived mentally or they're lying. There's a problem with that because we cannot set dates. But Jesus does teach us that we can be aware of the signs, and we ought to realize that he could come at any moment. Folks, he could come before this message is over. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be something? In fact, uh, I've thought about this in the past, that I think it'd be most wonderful to be in a church service with God's people when the Lord comes and catches us up out of this world. Wouldn't that be amazing? To know that we were worshiping Jesus, and he came and took us out of this world of sin and wickedness. If you will turn over to Luke chapter 17, and I'll share just a few more verses, and then I'll, I'll be done. Jesus promises, I will come again. Remember those verses I gave you from John 14? He said, I'm going. I go to prepare a place for you. And then he said, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. He gave the promise that he's coming again, that where I am there, you may be also. So looking at Luke 17, starting with verse number 30. Jesus here is talking, saying, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Well, folks, what is this about Lot's wife? Well, when the angels came to rescue Lot and his family out of the city of Sodom before God was going to destroy it. So Lot and his wife and his daughters, but not the guys they were betrothed to or to be married to, but uh, those four left with the angels. The angels even grabbing them by the hand to pull them out of the city uh, to try to get them away. 
And as they left the city, God began that destruction of fire and brimstone to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities there in the plains that were steeped in wickedness and, and idolatry and, and sexual immorality horrendously. And as they're being taken away, Lot's wife decides to turn back and look. And the angels had warned very sternly, do not look back. She looked back and she, in her heart, it indicates that she desired to be back there. That was her home city. That's where she wanted to be. Well, she didn't make it. She also turned into a pillar of salt, hit with that fire and that brimstone from heaven. And so it was just Lot and his two daughters that made it to safety. Remember Lot's wife. Why was Lot's wife destroyed? It's because she wanted to be in the city of worldliness and ungodliness. She didn't want to be rescued by the angel of the Lord. I'm looking for Jesus to return. I want to be rescued. Amen. That's what I'm living for. I'm not living for this world. I'm living for what God has prepared for us. One more verse, verse 33 in Luke 17. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. What does that mean? You can't save your own life. You can't save yourself. And if you try to make it to heaven on the basis of your good works, you're not going to make it. There's only one who can save you, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus tells us that we are to, to take up the cross daily and follow him. That we are to be, uh, as Paul put it, crucified with Christ. That we are to put ourselves and our desires uh, to death so that we can live for the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't save it. And if people spend all their lives just trying to fix their own problems and save their own lives, they're not going to make it. But whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. What does that mean, lose his life? It's denying self so that we can take on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said to put you on there for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to live for the glory of God. And if you live for Jesus, that means you're going to obey him. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. You've got to obey him and walk with him in righteousness. Folks, I just want to close by telling you that Jesus shed his blood. He died so that you and I might live forever with him in heaven, in his place. He's got that place that he's prepared for us. And he said, I'm coming again. Surely the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And so my question to close this message is, are you ready? Are you ready? You don't know what the future is going to bring as far as this life is concerned. But as uh, uh, Glenda sang earlier today in the service, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Paul said, I know I've believed in Jesus. And I know he's going to keep me safe through this virus, through uh, the world events, through uh, the evil and the wickedness of this world. And even if I come uh, to the point of where I'm going to die physically because of a virus or, or because of an accident or because of some natural process, I know that when my eyes close in death, my eyes are going to open in glory when I get to see Jesus face to face. And I, I love him for that. And I want to give him the praise and the glory because it's all about Jesus. And I just want to make sure that you're ready. All right, would you bow your heads? We're going to close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this scripture, for what we've got to see today. And Lord, we know that there's evil all around us. We know, dear Lord, of, of the wickedness of people who are just being used as tools of the devil who are doing his bidding and his deeds. And yet, dear Lord, we know that we have this book right here in front of us, this book of truth, this holy Bible, dear Lord, that shows us the pathway of eternal life. This book tells me about your love, how much you love me, how much you love all the world. This book tells me, dear Lord, that you, as the judge of this universe, will one day have all of us to give an account. But this book shows us, dear Lord, that there's a penalty of eternal damnation to those who are not saved, those who will uh, be in the lake of fire forever and ever. But it also tells us that those who are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ will be with you forever and ever in your glorious, blessed presence and will be rejoicing and worshiping you uh, for all of eternity. And Lord, I look forward to that. Jesus, I just ask that you continue to comfort us and walk with us, direct us and give us of your godly wisdom. Lord, help us to seek out your truth here in your book, in the scriptures, dear Lord, that can lead us and guide us down that pathway of righteousness. Would you bless our church here at Springdale, dear Lord, bless our folks, many who are not comfortable in getting back out in public yet, and many who are still sheltering at home, and I pray that you'll be with them and encourage them. 
for others that are out and about, dear Lord, that you protect them and be with them as they go from place to place. But most of all, that our lives would be a witness for you and that we might show the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God.